Welcome back to the ECB Forum on Central Banking. Um, we really would like to hear your feedback, so do continue to share your comments on social media under the hashtag ECB Forum. And of course, for the participants, don't hesitate, please, to raise your virtual hand and, 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 and let us know in advance when you want to submit a question to the, parties, to the uh, chair and, and the paper presenters and discussants. At this point, let's immediately jump into our next session, chaired by the Vice President uh, again. So the floor is yours, Vice President. Thank you very much, Thierry. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we are going to start, uh, you know, the second session. And uh, the second paper is going to be focused on uh, another consequential structural change in the world economy. That is the, the, the issue of climate change. Professor Rick van der Ploek from Oxford University will present the paper, Macrofinancial Implications of Climate Change and the Carbon Trans Transition. Among other elements, uh, it will set light on the best suited policy frameworks to guide the transition to a low carbon economy. So, Professor, you have the floor for 20 minutes. So the structure will be identical to the one of the, of the previous session. Thank you for this introduction um, and for the invitation. I will talk about uh, the microfinancial implications of climate change and the carbon transition. So it's probably best to first go to the, a very famous graph. It's been many of them have been shown before shown before. So what you see on the horizontal axis is the uh, total cumulative emissions of CO2 since 1870. That's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And along the vertical axis, you see the temperature uh, increase since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And what you're supposed to see really is a, a, a basically an upward sloping line. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's about two degrees per trillion tons of carbon is, the, is, is, is what you see. And what you see, it's up to 2010, that's the historical data. And from then on, you see all these projections by all these large scale science models. And, and you see also a wafer of uncertainty. And basically what you see is therefore uh, that anthropogenic man-made carbon emissions are really the prime driver of, of temperature. And that's what's causing us. Our, that's why our challenge is to keep, uh, get emissions down, get rid of emissions altogether if we can, and then we can actually make sure that we, that we, that we stick, uh, we can keep temperature to two degrees or perhaps even one and a half degrees. So the best way of doing that is, uh, I will argue and argue in this, this paper, is, is to price carbon. Uh, pricing carbon can be done via permit market, like we do with the ETS in, in Europe, but it can also be done via carbon taxes or indeed a combination of them. Uh, the advantage of pricing carbon are many fold. It, it cuts demand for fossil fuel. You leave more of the stuff in the ground. That's most important of all. You leave the coal, the oil and the reserves in the ground. You don't burn it. You substitute from the tar sands, which is very carbon intensive coal and crude oil to less carbon intensive fossil fuel, i.e. gas. Uh, you encourage uh, renewables and you, 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 you introduce markets for carbon capture and sequestration and you also curb slashing and burning of forests. Um, so, so on the whole, you also get some collateral benefits and that's often forgotten by pricing carbon and, 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 and you know, reducing emissions. You lower air pollution and therefore you get better health. The advantage of these collateral benefits is that they're local rather than than global. So it's very important to look at those as well. So, so there are many reasons why we need to price carbon one way or the other. And, and it's important for the narrative to, to, to mention all of these. So, but there are many problems. Uh, you can then ask if it's so easy, why are we doing it so little? So the first no brainer is before we even start pricing carbon, we should realize that the world is full of fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, the IMF estimated about six and a half percent of world GDP. Uh, there, there is enormous amount of coal, but really we should have a moratorium on coal. So these are the no-brainers. But, but so if we can't even do that, how can we even start to price carbon? So, 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 so that's the first point to make. Second point to make is that you're asking current generations to make, make sacrifices to, to cut global warming for the benefit of future, possibly richer generations. So then we need to make uh, schemes where you maybe run up the government debt or give some transfers to, to current generations to get an intergenerational win-win situation. Uh, Kotli, Koff and Koffers have, 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 have illustrated that very well. You also need uh, a common carbon price throughout the globe. So in every country of the world, it, it's efficient if it's the same. That's why, we, that's why economists advocate trading uh, in permits. Uh, 
but but to do that to 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 encourage poor countries to join in you need to give them transfers but it doesn't really happen another problem with carbon pricing is why it's difficult in practice it hurts the poor so you it's often a regressive uh, 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 carbon prices are regressive so you need to use part of the revenue to compensate lower income groups uh, to avoid problems like yellow vests so but that's obviously is often not done. So often people say, let's price carbon, but then they forget about the compensation for those who suffer most. Then another issue is well known. It's it's the biggest international free riding problem on, on the planet. Uh, so you will get, if, if you price carbon unilaterally, then that's basically a, a present to your neighbors because it will, will depress world's prices of oil and things like that. So that means that your neighbors will, will increase their emissions. So that's what's called carbon leakage. So the best way to do it is to get a level playing field. And you do that by having border tax adjustments. But uh, that's still difficult. It hasn't really been done properly, but that's what needs to be done. Alternatively, if you can't do the border tax adjustments, you might want to do production subsidies for steel, cement, and other industries. Uh, that are most at risk of foreign carbon intensive competition. Uh, so you want to price them, but you may want to offset them by giving them some production subsidy. So that's the best way of doing it. Alternatives, ways to avoid international free riding problems are climate tariff clubs or, or caution uh, policies like buying up forests so to, to, to preserve those carbon sinks. Another challenge with carbon pricing, why it's not so good as it is in theory, is the green paradox. Uh, politicians, and I speak as a former politician myself, have a tendency to postpone and to use the carrot instead of the stick. They like subsidies instead of taxes. So, so if that's the case, uh, there's a huge literature, both empirical and theoretical, that showed that oil sharks will pump up oil faster to avoid capital losses, which accelerates global warming, of course. So what you see is that, that to avoid the higher carbon price in the future, they're going to pump it up faster and that accelerates global warming. And then of course, uh, the many problems with policy failure and capture if you don't use uh, pricing carbon. So uh, particularly the governments tends to pick winners rather than, than uh, they, they think they're picking winners, but they often end up picking losers. So the, the, so the governments don't like carbon taxing, they prefer to give subsidies. So these are many reasons why, although we know that carbon pricing is the best, often it's not done in practice. It's interesting that, uh, and I'd like to say this here as a, as a citizen and not as a, as a central banker or a politician, that I, 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 it pleases me to say that central banks feel a much bigger urgency to do something about the climate and see it as part of their uh, fiduciary duties than maybe governments. Governments are taking much less action, and it, it, so it would be nice if the governments and, 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 and monetary authorities could go, could, could, go, could go up together in this task. So there have been two approaches to carbon pricing or climate policy. I mean, I mean, the bottom line is you want to credibly commit to a rising path of carbon prices. It's very important to do that uh, for, uh, to avoid all the problems and that uh, firms investing know this is going to be the, 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 the green economy. Of course, we don't have it. We have Obama followed by Trump and now we've got Biden. So there's a lot of volatility. There are two approaches, the Pigouvian approach, where you set carbon price to the sum of all the marginal damages. Yeah, it's called social cost of carbon, the present value of all damages from emitting one ton of carbon today. And, uh, and, 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 and then you adjust it for all kinds of tail risks, particularly, so and tipping points, because a lot of risks about the climate system and there's a lot of risk about the economic system. All of these tend to boost this, this Pigouvian price of carbon. But there's a more pragmatic approach used by central bankers and by the IPC it's just to put a cap on temperature, say two degrees or one and a half degrees. The big advantage of that is that it acts as a focal point. It is a bit ad hoc, but it acts as a focal point. It leads to a cap on cumulative emissions of, or, and, 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 and therefore uh, it actually makes it very easy for policy to talk about it. So although economists have been talking about the Pigouvian approach, most of the, poli the, the policy makers have been talking about this uh, temperature cap approach. So let's first look at this Pigouvian approach. So this is perhaps the best study by Burke et al. in Nature. And if you look at the right panel, you see the percentage losses in GDP as temperature increases from one to five degrees. So if you look at the blue line, that's the one coming from the Burke study. So it's much, much higher, it can go up to 40, 50% more. Uh, the losses if you go up to five degrees Celsius, which will happen if you don't do anything. There's the existing integrated assessment models, like the main one by DICE, uh, 
uh, for which uh, Norta got his Nobel Prize, predict uh, much lower losses. So we see there's a huge disagreement. Uh, I tend to think that the blue line is probably the more realistic one. What we also see in the left panel is that the uh, poorest uh, countries uh, are typically the ones that have the biggest uh, losses from, uh, from temperature rises, whereas the rich countries, they may actually uh, uh, even benefit sometimes. So this is, a, this is a, under a scenario where temperature goes up to about five degrees. So here we see, I uh, saw this diagram, if you go over here from two degrees and you go until you hit the line, then you can read off how much emissions you're allowed to have and that gives you your carbon budget. So, so what, what's been shown is that, um, that with these very high damages from Burkittal, so 12.5% of world GDP per degree Celsius, uh, uh, and if, if the slope of that line, the second line is one degree Celsius per trillion tons of carbon, you come up with the Pigouvian carbon price, very, very high of $245 per ton of CO2. It's much higher than many governments are, are contemplating. Interestingly, if you allow for uncertainties, it will be even higher. In contrast, the Nortas thing has much more modest damages, and they only come up uh, at about $18, $18 per ton of CO2. So the point is that there's a big range in these prices, which we should take account of. So uh, and that's probably the reason that big range why central banks and policymakers uh, have adopted a temperature cap uh, of two degrees. That temperature cap means that we can only burn about 150 to 300 gigatons of carbon from 2015 onwards. It means that global uh, at, at the global use of 10 gigatons of carbon, we deplete the carbon budget in about 15 to 30 years. Uh, if the temperature cap is lower or you have a tighter risk tolerance, um, it'll be much faster, it'll be in the next two or three years. So, so the big lesson from this story is that the temperature cap approach, we must keep fossil fuel reserves in the ground and not burn it. So, so all of Antarctica, all of the uh, uh, tar sands in Canada, for example. To achieve this, we need a carbon price that grows much faster than the rate of economic growth, which is, will be the case from the big moving approach. It has to grow at the rate of interest. So this is why if the purple line is the North House story and the dotted line is the IPCC story, you have to, uh, uh, you ramp up the carbon price much quicker. Therefore you stop much earlier uh, and therefore it's higher as well because the North House damages are not, a, a, are not high enough to ensure you to stay below two degrees Celsius. So that's another reason why people chose the IPCC approach. So that's what you, that's typically the type of carbon price path that needs to be followed. The problem is that most studies we see, they use rates of growth of the carbon price, which are ridiculously high. So, so sometimes they're five or 12% and the UK even has 15% per year. So, so that's a kind of a, a, a gigantic procrastination of carbon pricing. It's highly inefficient. I can see why it's happening politically because you don't have to do much today and all of it is done in the future. So it's also open to problems of green paradox. Christian Golle did a kind of asset pricing approach uh, and, and he speaks of the big green bet. And he, he finds that you should use the growth of carbon price should not be equal to the safe interest rate plus beta times the risk premium. And he finds if you do all the exercise, it comes about three and a half percent per year in real terms. So really, uh, so a good advice to countries is to start with a high government price and then let it grow in real terms at three and a half percent per year from that onwards and, 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 and then announce that and stick to it because so that the economy and the businesses know where, 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 that the world is changing from a carbon intensive world to a carbon free world. This is this famous study in Nature by McLeod and Eakins, where they show that uh, you need to, to keep, to get the two degrees target, you need, you need to keep a third of all oil in the ground, half of all gas, and 80% and, uh, and of all coal should be unburned. Now, the problem is that most of the oil companies have reserves, and, and, and likely reserves, called resources here, maybe three to 10 or 10, 11 times as big as, 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 as what is necessary. So, so either those companies are overvalued, or, or the climate policy is not really credible yet. So this is quite an astonishing figure uh, to, to think about. So we need to really, uh, as I said, that if you allow for these stale risks uh, in either approach, whether it's the Bigouvian approach or the IPCC approach, uh, there's a lot of tail risk because of tipping points. Uh, so think of the, the, the tipping points due to the melting of the permafrost, uh, reversal of the Gulf Stream, melting of the gigantic ice sheets like the Antarctic ice sheet or Greenland, those, those uncertainties will lead for precautionary reasons to an enormous, more ambitious climate policy than we would have done otherwise. Um, now, there are people who argue, and I, I, I disagree with that a bit, 
Uh, there's a famous paper by uh, Daniel et al. in the Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, who <coughs> argue that as over time, also using an asset pricing approach, damage uncertainty is gradually resolved. There's a, and if there's a preference for early resolution of uncertainty, op optimal karma price has a tendency to fall. Um, that's less clear if you if you allow for um, if you allow for, for the fact that tipping points are recurring, like these nine tipping points I just mentioned, uh, then that thing won't happen and the common price will be rising again, as been shown in this paper by Kain Lenton. So I, I think it's important for central banks, but also for economists to think more about the financial aspects of climate policy. Because at the moment, uh, what's going to happen is that these carbon and sensor, sensor sectors or brown sectors will either have to adjust or they will have to run down their carbon intensive capital stocks. And, and these slides in the paper goes a bit at length to talk about that there's a diversification perspective and there's a climate perspective. From a climate perspective, you want to run down the dirty capital stock completely, but you may not, you may not want to do that if you need to have some of that dirty capital for diversification reasons. So what, what can be shown is that these diversification considerations uh, can prevent driving carbon intensive capital stock to zero if climate damages are modest. So it kind of frustrates climate policy a little bit. So we need to look uh, at those aspects, whether that's important or whether it's just a theoretical curiosity. You see that in this graph that uh, the, the share of dirty capital uh, comes down by more in the absence of climate policies, a dotted line. In the, if you have climate policy damages, you bring down the share of dirty capital by more, but, but not to zero. But if you increase damages more and more and more, you will bring it down to zero. Uh, and, and, and so we need to look at more of those type of capital asset pricing models. I want to make a few points about disruptions, uh, particularly the risk of stranded assets. Uh, so there's policy uncertainty, policy tipping, and irreversible investments can lead to uh, to sudden revaluations of financial assets and the risk of stranded assets. I did, you have to scrap the investments in, for example, coal-fired power stations. So it's important to distinguish those transition risks from physical risks. So um, the empirical evidence, and I think it's important to say something about that, suggests, uh, particularly these two papers, that uh, investors are already demanding higher stock market returns after controlling for the pharma French factors like size and book to market, et cetera. Uh, uh, but because they want to be compensated for the risk uh, that those, uh, that those, that those uh, uh, the carbon risk that those firms face uh, because when the green transition really takes place. In actual fact, uh, the, uh, people can actually show that as the markets have started to price in the climate transition, as people have become more aware of climate change risks, you will find that there is actually uh, uh, that, 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 that investors demand a, a higher risk premium on those carbon intensive assets. So really, maybe in a certain sense, the market is seeing already more of this than maybe governments are. So. Um, and you see, of course, a, 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 an increase in, in investors with preferences for green investing and empire impact, environmental impact investing. So uh, in the discussion, it would be nice to talk about uh, gradually papers are starting to appear on uh, Taylor rules, should they respond to global warming? Yes or not, maybe it depends on divine coincidence. Uh, maybe if you, uh, the negative effects of carbon pricing and output are curbed, if you recycle some of the revenue via lower labor income tax, and that's particularly true if there's a lot of wage and price slugg sluggishness. People have argued for pro-cyclical carbon taxes. People have argued for uh, pro-cyclical, uh, for, for macroprudential wage, which differ for uh, green investments in carbon taxes and for easing reserve ratios for low carbon lending for using central bank collateral to cut emissions. So I finish with my last slide or two. So the first one is that there is a, that we need to look at networks, uh, follow the work of the network for greening financial systems. Uh, there's a lot of work on financial con contagion uh, and that particularly that for larger negative shocks, propagation of shocks can lead to a fragile uh, financial system. So we need to look at uh, the resilience of financial systems. And that really depends on the structure of networks, star-like nature of the networks. The network structure really matters. Uh, and it may be that climate uh, monetary policy, like monetary policy, may make network denser. So a str stronger climate policies may have larger effects than small climate policies. So in the end, I think then, therefore, um, we need to be aware that riding a carbon bubble may be irrational for, uh, may be rational for as long as these self-reinforcing linkages uh, and liquidity is forthcoming. But when the musical chairs stop, when the music stops, uh, then they may be stuck. 
uh, financial regulators are aware of these risks. So that's therefore an important case for climate stress testing um, and to avoid market panics and systemic risks. So, um, so to, to come up with a conclusion, um, I would argue for a uh, determine a safe carbon budget, commit to a steadily growing carbon price at say 3.5% per year, take account of all the climatic and economic risks, carbon price should start high enough to avoid green paradox effects. Uh, the paper also argues for an independent emissions authority or a carbon central bank. If you to ensure cumulative emissions stay below a cap, so you want to give a clear mandate to such an emissions authority to curb the influence of, of lobbies and political uh, political influence, just like you we've handed uh, we've handed the, the monetary mandate over to the central banks. Maybe we should think a bit about that. It's a bit more radical, but it will be useful to think about it. It's important to use the revenue to compensate low incomes and firms that are most at risk of uh, leakage. Uh, if bar carbon border tax adjustments are infeasible, use debt or transfers to uh, the to the current generations to ensure an intergenerational win-win. And um, you need complementary macro policies. Think of green green quantitative easing, more stringent prudential policies for carbon-intensive companies. Need public funds to finance low carbon transition. Investors are already uh, demanding high returns from dirty companies to be compensated for the transition risk. And carbon intensive firms already need to pay higher interest on their loans because they're risky. So the, the crucial thing, and I want to finish with that, is to avoid disorderly green transition uh, by climate uh, stress testing and to, to, to realize that these transition risks can be amplified in networks through defaults and contagion, especially when balance sheets are not very well di diversified. So, so continue rolling out initiatives and the benchmarking uh, taken by the, the NGFS and others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rick, for this uh, very rich, uh, comprehensive and insightful presentation. Now the paper is going to be discussed by Signe Krostrup, uh, member of the Board of Governors of the Danish Central Bank. Uh, Signe, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much and, and thank you for having me discuss this very interesting paper and I would say greetings from Copenhagen, uh, first of all. So this is a very interesting paper on the macroeconomic, uh, macrofinancial implications of climate change and the carbon transition by Frederick van der Ploeg. And I very much enjoyed reading this paper. It covers vast ground and it is uh, particularly focused on the insights that uh, we have from the asset pricing and the finance literature for climate change. And I think that that is a contribution in itself. It's relevant and timely, and I actually had prepared to tell you why, but I think that uh, Professor van der Plug made a very good case of this, so I can skip that part and just say that uh, we are heading into a, a large scale transition of our economies and, and we will need policy to guide that process. And I think that in this sense, I think this paper is going to be a very valuable uh, guide and will also inform that process. Well, now, I read this paper uh, with a particular interest in what the literature tells us or what the literature teaches us about the implications of climate change and the transition for central banks. And I know I'm not alone uh, in, in this interest. Um, just the fact that we're discussing climate and the climate uh, literature here in Sintra virtually is, is a very much an illustration of this interest. But I also have here a slide. Um, let me see if I can change slide. Yes, there. I have here a slide that, that shows you um, Financial Times articles and tweets since 2010 with the phrases climate change and central bank in them. And you can clearly see that this uh, index, it took off uh, from 2018. It has plunged a bit. And I would say that that is uh, the so-called march of events. Uh, COVID-19 that took a lot of attention, but I do expect that this trend will continue to increase. And there are very good reasons for this interest. Um, it's clear from this review that uh, climate change and the transition will affect economic outcomes and financial markets that are core to the, to the mandates of many central banks. There are, there's a lot of, of insight in, in this very vast uh, literature that has been summarized in this paper, and I cannot possibly do justice to all of that in my discussion, but I, I have fo focused on a few points that I find to be particular, 
salience. And let me switch to the first comment I have. It's actually more of an observation. Um, it is that how clearly, when you look at the literature and optimal carbon pricing, and combine that with the finance literature and the risk and the, and the literature on, on stranded assets, how clearly that illustrates the importance of taking into account the transition when you're evaluating financial stability. And uh, I just want to make that point here uh, graphically. So this is a, a mock chart of an optimal carbon price. Uh, this is the IPCC approach that Van der Ploeg spoke about, the optimal carbon price in purple which starts out relatively high, and then it has a very smooth increasing rate, which is equal to the interest rate, and I might get back to that. Um, if the carbon price does not start out high enough, if there is a delay in policy, then we'll start out lower, and the, then we're on the blue line, and then we'll have to have a much steeper increase at a later date in carbon pricing. And if on top of that, we're not, we're not expecting uh, on top of that, if, we're, if markets are not expecting or not sure that this carbon price will actually increase, then this will not be priced in, in assets smoothly. And then we're at a risk of having so-called policy tipping points at a later stage, where the risk and severity of stranded assets are much uh, in, increased. And this just points out how important it is to take into account these transition uh, risks when you're evaluating financial stability. And I want to say that these types of scenarios are already being looked at by many central banks, including our own. We had, last week we came out with a, a climate stress test of our banking sector to exactly these types of both moderate and, and uh, delayed policy scenarios. Which brings me to the second uh, point. Um, this is on the literature, uh, the literature review on the empirical evidence on whether risks uh, associated with climate change are priced in the market or whether the markets are underpricing climate risks. This is a, a really important question for, for many reasons. And I think that it's a very, very much a value added of the paper to go through this literature, but it does. This is, this is my question is, what can we really conclude from that literature on whether we are seeing underpricing of climate risks? And I would very much welcome more discussion of that. And let me just explain. So the, 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 the question is really important because if, if, if markets are not pricing climate risks appropriately, it means that they're not performing, markets cannot perform their role in, in allocating finance to where it's most needed. So away from uh, uh, carbon intensive investments toward investments that are um, supporting the transition. It also means that we might end up having risks placed in balance sheets that do not have the absorptive capacity for those risks. And then we again, we have a finan financial stability problem. And there are very good reasons why we uh, would expect or we would suspect that markets are not adequately or, or correctly pricing climate risks. And they have, uh, that it would be nice to actually talk about those, but I, I don't have, I, I would say that just they are mostly related to uh, information challenge. We don't have a, enough information to, to make these pricing. This lack of information and transparency in the markets on, on the climate risk and exposures is also a reason why it's very hard to find, to come up with a design of empirical studies that would actually allow us to identify these types of risks. Um, what this literature does is it takes asset prices and it's, it looks at whether there's an association between different types of asset prices and related risk metrics for, for climate change or it looks, it looks at the uh, asset price responses to news about, for instance, uh, transition policy. And I have an example of that in the slide here. This is from a study from the ECB and ESRB that came out, very interesting study that came out last summer, which looks at, uh, associates the, the um, emission scores of EU banks and insurers uh, with price to book ratios to look to see if there is a, and actually if climate risk might be associated in, or reflected in these prices. And I, I'll not talk more about that. That's just an example. There's a, a quite a big literature looking at these types of studies. But my question is that I think that we can conclude that yes, in many cases, asset prices are sensitive to different types of climate risks, but not all. There is also some it, there is some evidence that this sensitivity has been increasing in recent years, which is a, a good sign. But going from there to concluding about um, systematic underpricing of climate risks, that is the discussion that I'm missing, and I would very much like to hear your, your uh, point of view uh, on that. 
And that brings me to my uh, uh, final point. And um, this, this literature already covers a lot of ground. And this final point is asking you to cover just a little bit more. Um, that is, uh, there's a lot of, of, of this literature. There's in the review, there are many places where there is a hint at an interaction between interest rate levels and climate change or climate, climate policy. And in light of the fact that we have a big literature that will be discussed later in this conference on uh, falling natural real interest rates, let me show you an example of that here. Um, there, that would be very interesting to, to explore further. What does it mean when interest rates uh, have become very low? And what does it mean when interest rates are, in fact, some real interest rates may, may in fact be negative at this point? What does that mean for some of the conclusions that this paper or this, this, uh, the, the literature surveyed in this paper draws? And I want to bring two examples um, that I have in mind. And the first one is the, the fact that um, this IPCC approach to the optimal carbon price path links the car carbon price path to the interest rate. Well, what if that interest rate has in fact turned very low or even negative? Would that mean that we in, a, in some optimal scenario would want to have carbon prices that are front loaded, that, we, that are much higher to begin with and that are actually dropping over time so that we front load the abatement cost? That would be a question. Uh, another question is uh, that the, the literature review shows that some asset pricing literature suggests that when we have increased climate damages, when, when, when the global warming proceeds, we may have more volatility, and this could lead to an increased design for saving for precautionary reasons, for instance. And there are other channels like that, uh, that, that the climate could affect the natural real interest rate because it might raise desired savings levels. So is there an association between climate change and the natural real interest rates? Because that would have, of course, important implications for, for monetary policy space going forward. So those are our, uh, some of the main comments I wanted to draw. Let me just um, conclude and say that this was a very nice and very interesting and I think a very important paper. It looks uh, at, at vast and expanding literature and I think it has important implications for macro financial policies. First of all, it is very clear from the paper that fiscal tools and particular carbon pricing is first in line and central for achieving this a cost efficient transition that we're aiming at. But the literature also makes it clear that central banks have a stake in the transition and will respond to that because it affects the economic and financial stability outcomes that we care about according to, to many mandates. Uh, and I think I will stop here. I think that uh, you have made uh, a lot of good points with respect to financial, financial stability and the implications of climate change. Um, before, you know, going back to, to, prof to Professor van der Ploek, uh, just to remind the, 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 the audience that if they want to, to ask any question, to make any points, uh, they should uh, raise uh, their virtual hands. So, uh, Professor, uh, I don't know whether you, you want to make any comments with respect to the to the discussion. And the yes, it will be very nice. The, my first comment is to thank you very much for your kind words and for your interesting questions. Um, so the, the first point, yes, it is true that politicians have a tendency to, to, to procrastinate. Uh, I, I, and I say that literally as, as my experience when I was in government. So it's, we agree to Paris and then you come home, you, you take a big picture. But then of course the carbon pricing is always, preferably in climate policy is always kind of delegated to your successors. So yeah. you, you so, so there's always this tendency that uh, you started with carbon pricing much too low. And that and then as Signal says that that means that you have to do much more later on. You have to to, 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 to kind of ramp up your climate policy later on as you showed in the graph. And 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 then the paper talks a bit about that how costly that is. So the delay of doing that if you still want to reach your target of two degrees and stay underneath. And if, you, if you're starting off too slowly, it's very costly. It's, it, 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 it is usually costly and it's, very, it's a very stupid thing to do. It's the same thing as with the pandemic. If you want to solve the pandemic, it's best to take action when it hasn't really taken hold of a large part of the population yet. So, so if you do it quickly and, and strong, uh, that's much more efficient than if you wait and late. Because if, if you wait later, then people get locked into the wrong type of technology, they get locked into the wrong type of capital, it becomes much more costly. Uh, 
So, so this is an extremely important point, and it's, it's maybe it was a bit snowed under in the paper, but I think it's extremely important to make, and I, I think it is something more for the, the governments to, to think about it, but it is really important. Then, then you mentioned those tweets. I didn't know that of, in the Financial Times, and I think that's really interesting because you show that for between 2010 and 2017, it was all almost nothing, and then it really exploded, and then it came down a bit during the pandemic. But, but really, that's that that's very similar to the paper I discussed where on climate awareness. So what you see that that as more tweets, more FT, and you see this also from harvesting the internet with, with linguistic, with uh, machine learning techniques, you see also this this sudden increase, this increase the last so many years. So, so and what people have shown is that uh, in a follow-up to the Bolton, Bolton and Kaspichik study is that as climate awareness becomes more important, uh, uh, then, then investors they, they, they are more aware of the transition risk, exactly as you say, and then they demand uh, a higher rate of return on those assets which are most subject to, 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 to carbon transition risk, i.e. steel, cement, uh, the, 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 oil, the oil industries, etc. So, so, so that's so that so, so I think there's uh, some empirical evidence becoming up now, a bit proper, uh, uh, yeah, pr proper econometrics, uh, and also allowing for all the usual suspects, that as you introduce climate awareness, uh, that, 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 that that it's priced in more if you want uh, that those risks, and, and and that wasn't the case maybe ten years ago, or even five years ago, but it's gradually being priced in more and more. So, so that's in a sense good because then people can take actions. And then people eventually will help to get a more efficient allocation of capital across the different sectors. Now, you, you, I like your, and I very quickly, uh, uh, your final points about the interaction between interest rates and climate. Uh, so you mentioned that we have the, maybe the secular stagnation or maybe the, for whatever reason whatsoever, real rates of interest have become very low. And, 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 very, very, and, and then, of course, if that's the case, then, they, then you would expect that, that you would want to price carbon much more, uh, either because of the big moving approach because the present discounted value of damages is very high, or if you take the IPCC approach, then you will have a much lower increase in the, uh, in the path of uh, carbon prices, and therefore you, by necessity, start off much higher. So you do much more upfront. You call that front loading, and and that's that comes out exactly out of those stuff. So maybe I should have highlighted that a bit more, but that's exactly what you get. So, um, but a final point, you say, well, what happens if the rate of interest goes negative? Well, what I try to argue in the paper is that what's relevant is the uh, risk-adjusted rate of interest, and although the the safe rate of interest may be negative or maybe close to zero, uh, once you uh, allow for the risk premium because damages are strongly correlated with the future state of the economy, or even your IPCC approach, you get the same type of story. You want to add a risk premium and then typically rather than 0% or it may be 3 or 4%, uh, but it'll be lower, but it, it won't necessarily be so f at current uh, figures, it won't be negative. But yes, those interactions between climate policy and real rates of interest are, are, are very interesting. And uh, uh, in the revision, maybe I, I will say a bit more on that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, you know, now two participants that want to, to, to ask uh, questions. The first one is Ellen Ray, and the second one is Harold Woldlick. So we can, uh, if you can, uh, you know, we are going to, to, to bundle together both questions. And afterwards, you can respond to both of them. Ellen, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the very rich presentation and discussion. Uh, Rick, in your paper, you tend to oppose uh, price and quantity approaches, but you also note that it, uh, it may be time for institutional innovation and the creation of a carbon central bank, uh, as discussed, for example, by uh, Jacques Delpin and Christian Gaulier, or the creation of maybe carbon councils, uh, as discussed uh, uh, in our report of a group of 30. Now, uh, this type of new institution could use uh, models mapping carbon permit issuances and carbon, carbon prices and target a certain carbon price path consistent with a path of carbon issuances in order to reach net zero in 2050. Of course, uh, this mapping would be conditional on an economic model of climate change at a certain point in time. But if one thinks about it this way, I think this would make the job of such a carbon council very similar to the job of a, of a central banker. It would be about targeting a price path uh, with forward guidance, 
And I think doing this this way would be particularly beneficial because it would give credibility and predictability to the carbon price path, which are both key uh, if one wants to uh, unleash green investments. So do you think that this type of institutional innovation, a carbon council uh, modeled really like an independent and accountable central bank with a mandate of net zero in 2050 set by the government uh, would be a good way to, to implement climate policy? And, and second quick question, if some jurisdictions were to go that way uh, and to have very active climate policy, then carbon adjustment char charges at the borders are really key, uh, given the geographical distribution of greenhouse uh, gas emissions, which, is, which are very unequally distributed around the globe. So how would you implement them on a subset of carbon intensive goods, on all goods? How do you measure uh, the carbon content? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Harold, you have the, the, the floor. Harald? Well, I think that we have, uh, you know, some problems with the connection, so perhaps, you know, we can go first uh, to the question uh, asked by, by Ellen, to the points made by Ellen. Rick. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Helen. These are, these are very good points. <laughs> uh, so, so the idea for an independent uh, emissions authority or a carbon central bank or a carbon council was originally made by uh, Cameron Hepburn and, and Helm and, and, and Mash many, uh, some 10 years ago. Uh, and it's been made again in a number of, in, by journalists and also by Gollier for France. And I, I also, I should have also referred to your Carbon Council paper on the G, of the G30. So, so I, I think, so we agree on that. I think that's very, very important. Uh, I think also the idea that's the, to, to work out particularly the mandate for that is if you target, uh, if you target the idea that emissions have to come down to zero by 2050, then associated with that is a carbon price path. And you want to give that particular mandate to that, to that council, and you want to take it out of the hands of politicians, and you want to say, just like you give it to a central bank, you give the mandate to keep inflation below 2% or whatever you want to, in a sense, on a global level, you would give the mandate to keep the temperature below one and a half degrees, but say maybe on a, on a more uh, European level or something like that, you, you would indeed mandate it to, to, to do whatever carbon prices are necessary to make sure that cumulative emissions uh, go down to zero by the year 2050. So I, I, I completely agree with that. And, and I think that would be the most important institutional innovation we could do. And it, it really would help because my experience in politics is that every time you want to price it, it gets done the wrong way. It doesn't get done. It gets done too weak. It gets done too late. And it gets done with too many exemptions. So that, that's really why you wanted to have it out of the hands of politicians uh, and, and give it to an independent authority. Uh, we have these papers, I think by Alessina and others, on bureaucrats versus uh, versus versus uh, politicians, and, and and this is a clear case where it should be delegated uh, away. Uh, uh, so your 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 second point is that of course, if you go with a subgroup of countries like that, even if it's just all of Europe, but even then, you'd have to do something with the borders. So so the first best would be um, to have uh, border tax adjustments, where you would have uh, 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 basically any imports from abroad. That, are, uh, that, 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 that do not that, that do not tax that stuff, so that that, that have a lower carbon tax than in uh, than in the in, in in Europe, then you would have to compensate for the difference. You would have to levy that tax at the border. So by now there are quite a few uh, papers on that. Who try to analyze that? There's a particular Caroline Fisher has done some work on that, and they they where they look at the particular features on how you can do that best. If you can't do the border tax adjustments, or if they, uh, you know, if they they're not compatible with the WTO, I think they are compatible with the WTO. But if they're not, then then you come to second best policies where you you price carbon vigorously, but you 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 then governments may may give some subsidies to these. To these, to these, to the, to, to, to steel and cement in order to, to get an efficient outcome. That's been worked. It's been done by uh, Meredith Foley. Has done good work on that for the uh, uh, cement in Portland and then uh, facing imports from um, from Mexico. So that will be a second best policy. But that really is another crucial aspect of climate policy. If you, if otherwise, if you don't, if you don't solve that problem, there will be just too many lobbies. Uh, 
from a carbon intensive industries, which will make, basically make sure that your whole climate policy will not even get a, get a start uh, as far as a Minister of Finance or Minister of Social Affairs is concerned, let alone a Minister of Climate. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much, Rick. I don't know, Signe, if you want to, to add uh, anything. I have no, uh, nothing to add. Very good. So let's try now Harold uh, Orlik from the University of uh, Chicago. Harold, you have the floor. Yeah. C can you can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So excellent presentation, Rick. I, I really loved it. So many so many points. Uh, I want to sound a note of caution on these expert com co committees, and maybe by extension, also on the role of monetary policy here. Um, it's going to be very hard to create policies that achieve a Pareto gain where everybody gains, right? Often, you know, what, whatever choices are made, there will be trade-offs. Some will be better off, some are worse off. So um, if monetary policy gets in the act of these expert commissions, gets in the act of setting policies, what do we tell people that lose jobs? What do we tell industries that go down the drain? Uh, what do we tell voters when they feel they don't have a say in how all these policies affect them? Um, I'm, I'm a bit worried that, uh, that, uh, that we take uh, mandates that have been there in order to safeguard the financial system in general and to safeguard the price system and tailor them to um, specific, specific policy agenda, however well that may have been meant. So maybe, Rick, if you can reflect on that a little bit more, whether you're worried or not that uh, you know, taking these pro uh, processes out of political hands is a good or bad idea. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Very good point, Harald. Uh, Rick, Signe. Yes, I think this is an extremely important point. And, and because of the shortness of the, uh, the presentation, I couldn't go into those details. It is, of course, true that if you hand over the carbon pricing to an independent authority or to, to, to a carbon council, then somebody will need to collect the carbon tax revenue. So I, ho I, I presume that one way or another, the carbon tax revenue or the permit revenue or whatever it is, uh, goes back to the member states or, the, or to the participating states. Uh, and they need that because, uh, as you rightly say, you'd want to avoid yellow vests as well. You don't only want to kind of have all kinds of dirty imports from abroad. You want to avoid that, but you also want to avoid that uh, in as far as these carbon taxes are seen to be, uh, are, uh, it's not about taxation. This is really, uh, we are really bad on language as economists. It's really about shifting taxes. It's so you really, you want to tell the narrative, politicians should be able to tell the narrative, no, we're not taxing you. We're just putting the burden somewhere. We're putting the burden on those things that are dirty to watch other things which are more good for the economy or are cleaner. So really, so really, the revenue should go back to the to the private sector, and in a particularly done in a particular way. It needs to be designed in a way that it really helps those who are hurt most by it. So, and otherwise, we get the you're feeding the the, the seeds of populism, uh, and quite rightly so, because then 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 it become unpopular, and and people will protest. So 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 the money the and and we've seen many cases. That if you uh, so in separate papers by myself but others as well, if you um, recycle some of the revenue partially in the lower income tax but partially in visible carbon dividends, so you give people uh, sums of money uh, which they are visible even before you start pricing carbon, then you can get them across uh, the line and you get political majority, uh, and and that 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 aspect the political economy of of carbon pricing is something we really need to think about. But but that can be separated from the monetary the systemic risk uh, responsibilities of central banks and from the need to price carbon. But then, then to make sure that you get a, a majority and that, that you make sure you, 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 that, that people don't go down the drain and, and that people don't feel that they're left behind, you need to do something on that front. And, and indeed, uh, a large part of the literature is, is exactly on that. Uh, and, and that's a lot of, of my work has been on that as well. So I think it's a, a very important point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, Signe? Uh, let me just ask, there's also a question of, of which tools are appropriate to use for what goals. And I think if we're concerned about redistribution, which of course we are, then the question is which tools should be used. And, and often we will think of the uh, tax and transfer system for that. So there should be a clear division of, of, of tools and goals. That's also part of this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you, Signe. Uh, well, you know, I I, I just to remind you that uh, to the participants, if you want to, 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 to make a quest to ask a question, please uh, raise your visual hands. So the next uh, question uh, is going to be posed by François Villeroy de Gallo, the governor of the Bank de France. François, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Chris. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rick, for your presentation. And thank you for quoting the NGFS, this network for greening the financial system, which, as we are aware, is a European-born object, more or less. Uh, I have a good news to share with everybody that Randy Quayle's vice chair of the US Fed, announced yesterday in the Senate Banking Committee that the Fed would apply to join the NGFS. And I think it's a significant game changer. We can rejoice about that as we know that the DNB is sharing the NGFS, the Banque de France is holding the Secretariat. So I wanted to share this good news. And perhaps uh, to come to our discussion, uh, I will focus perhaps on the question uh, of the link between central banks and climate change and monetary policy and climate change. Why should we care, to put it in a nutshell? I, I tend to conclude from your, your two presentations, but tell me if I am right, that there are at least two reasons. The first one, Rick, is obviously inflation. I don't know if we will come to a carbon price as high and growing as quickly as you suggest. There are political difficulties, as already mentioned. But it would be extremely significant on the inflation journey which is ahead. We know there are already effects of climate change, short term in the economic outlook, uh, look at the level of the Rhine, etc. But you give us probably with these figures the, 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 the best proof that dealing with climate change is not mission creeping for us. And my conviction is that we don't need to change our mandate. Our mandate is price stability. This issue of carbon price would affect it very significantly. The second reason, and here I refer more signal to, to your uh, presentation, is this question of risk pricing in financial markets. Uh, and Christine Lagarde said it some days ago. Uh, if financial markets don't price correctly the climate risk. And I think it's a case. It's really a worry for us. Uh, it, perhaps the level of interest rate is misleading, but at least the value of each class of assets is misleading. And here our answer could be a, a more differentiated monetary policy, perhaps. I refer to our assessment of collateral. We have at present a financial assessment of collateral, which is fully needed and warranted. But we could have, and I, I would tend to say we should have, also an assessment of uh, uh, the climate-related financial risk, which is in the collateral. And this would be a very powerful trigger for financial markets to incorporate this kind of risk. I, I will stop there. Thank you very much, Francois. Rick? Oh, I'll be very quick. I think uh, I, I, well, I'm very happy that uh, now with the elections in America, that 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 the the the, the Fed will join the NGFS. That's that's a that's a major factor. That's really a big signal. So that makes me very. I'm happy already today. So that's good. Uh, so I also think that your point that the the carbon pricing may add to inflation inflationary pressures that's exactly what a, a beginning literature is beginning to focus on and then how that would affect your uh, your your monetary policy so i think that's a, a particularly important thing to look at i, I discuss in the paper uh, uh, differential collateral policies so that if you have as if people put up a collateral which is maybe a, a coal-fired power station as we know that these coal-fired power stations at some point have to shut down maybe before the end of their economic lifetime, then that may not be such a good collateral as a, as a collateral maybe in a wind farm. So, so obviously, to, to think about these issues is inc incredibly important. So I'm, I'm glad you reiterated that. So, so thank you very much. And I, I give thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick Signe. You are a central banker for sure that you want to add uh, something. Yeah. 
So let me say that I, I fully agree with some of these uh, reasons why we as central banks should care about this. It is because climate change, and I just reiterate, climate change is affecting economic outcomes, and, and, and by, by this I mean perhaps in, in the inflationary process, and it also will affect financial markets and concerns about financial stability. And, uh, and this issue of, of risk pricing is key, and that's why I also focused on that in my comments. But first, on, on inflation, I think that this is also a point that is really interesting to understand better. I know that this is one of the topics that are also being looked at in the network for greening the financial system. And uh, we, we really need more analysis of this uh, point, and I know that that's ongoing. Um, so I, I fully agree with the, the importance of this point. Um, this point about risk pricing and collateral frameworks, um, I think that it's, it's really important that collateral frameworks are reflecting risks appropriately. And if we do think that risks are uh, not reflected appropriately, then they should be. And then we need to take into account these underpriced, uh, supposedly underpriced climate related risks. Uh, and I think that there's not much doubt about that. The, the issue is the how. Uh, and that was one of the things that I tried to, to talk about in, in my comments is that if we have the problem of underpriced risk in the market, it's very much related to a lack of uh, transparency information. And there's a lot of work going into trying to increase transparency and to come up with taxonomies to better be able to compare and contrast different risks uh, to, come to, to improve uh, reporting requirements so that we get more transparency that we can use for risk pricing. But um, these problems that are causing the, the, the mispricing in markets are also, also problems when we need to uh, assess the, the mispriced risks for, for instance, and how we apply them in collateral frameworks. And um, that, was a, that was a question that I posed to, to uh, Rick, and I would very much also welcome if the literature has anything to say about that, because I think here the devil is in the details, is how, how do you actually implement something like this? Thank you very much, Signe. I think that we have time for you know, our last question. Lucrecia Reislin from the London Business School. Lucrecia, you have the floor, please. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I wanted to follow up from the point that was just made. I think that whatever you want to do in terms of collateral, or also in terms of financial stability monitoring, uh, needs data and needs uh, you know data uh, on how uh, you know this risk affect the values of the company, and for that we need to go from uh, uh, recommendations uh, which are there on how companies uh, um, should take in consideration uh, climate related risk. Uh, I'm here thinking, for example, of the task force, the TCFD task force, uh, which has issued several recommendations, but we have to go from that uh, to standards and to, you know, to you know, mandatory standards so that we can have auditable information. And, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, from that, from that, we will have, you know, that will follow provisioning and everything that has to follow, which is necessary for financial stability. So I think that this, is also requires uh, a piece of a new, you know, new institutional build up in the, in the financial architecture. So we need, uh, you know, standard setting uh, on climate related risk. And uh, it seems to me that this should be very, very high in the priorities in this agenda. Thank you, Lucrecia. I think that, uh, you know, this point about mandatory disclosure is key, but, uh, you know, I would like to, to, to listen to, to Rick and to Signe. Signa, do you want to go first? Um, let me just come and say that uh, that I, I fully agree on the premise that that we need more information and more transparency. And I know that there is a lot of work in, in this direction. We also have the task force on on climate related uh, financial disclosures. I think that there's a lot of work in that direction, and I fully agree that uh, that that we need we need to take further steps. Um, and uh, yeah, I will leave it at that. And um, and hear what you have to say, Rick, on that point. Yeah, I think the work on collateral and on loans and the data, but it's, it's, there's some interesting paper, I'm thinking of a paper by Mendicini in journal Monterey Economics, where they're working on this issue. So you could, you could think of those frameworks also 
to look at climate risks. And 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 and, and I think therefore the, the biggest important thing is to get a correct data set up, as you say, and to get a to get a kind of particular uh, institutional setup, which makes sure that it's all collected in the same way. There are data on loans and there are data on collateral. And indeed, in Oxford, we have uh, we have them via Ben Caldercott, who is doing a big thing on stranded asset, but also on these loans data. Uh, I think also sometimes in collaboration with the NGFS. But that really needs to kind of now link up with the, the best researchers in the field, uh, monetary and finance researchers, to exactly tackle those questions. So so I'm, I'm very happy with Lucretia's comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick uh, and Signe. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations, for your comments. I think that this, this has been, you know, an uh, extremely insightful uh, debate. I think that a lot of issues have, uh, have been raised. I think that uh, climate change is going to be a key issue, not only for fiscal authorities, but as well for uh, central banks. And uh, in that respect, I think that, uh, you know, this discussion, you know, is going to shed light to some of the main topics that we will be dealing with over the next years. Thank you very much again. And, and uh, you know, uh, Thierry, I don't know whether you know you want to, to announce anything. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you very much indeed for this session on climate change. Um, we'll now have another break for 15 minutes and resume at five sharply. Meanwhile, don't hesitate, of course, to cast your votes for the young economists. So, see you soon. <laughs>Christy Jansen. I'm 28 years old and I'm from the Netherlands. Ciao, my name is Antonio Marci. I am 29 years old and I am from Italy. Ni hao, my name is Ying Jie Qi. I'm 32 years old and I'm from China. My work studies monetary policy in economies with domestic and international production chains. I'm interested in the interaction between monetary policy and financial stability. My research is on the role of information choice in macroeconomics and finance. I'm interested in finance and development. I do research in banking and corporate finance. My work is about the policies of the European Central Bank which directly affect the risk premium on the sovereign debt of peripheral countries. I study how long-term investors change their bond holdings after a shift in regulation and how these changes subsequently affected interest rates. I found that savers choose to get more information about which bank or product they should use for their saving in recessions. My work explores how voter preferences determine financial regulation, focusing in particular on the role of political connections in this process.